Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, PLMA Australia New Zealand event today. Um, it's a great, great honor to have everybody here today um, for this very special webinar on sustainability doesn't have to cost, how to create a win-win for your private label business and the environment. I think you'll find uh, today that there's a lot of really great insights for your business that's all uh, That'll certainly open up opportunities for your business. And um, and before I introduce our special guest, I'd just like to run through just um, a few housekeeping um, elements for today, just uh, as per um, our members who have attended our events in the past and uh, for benefit of non-members and welcome to you today as well, who we have joining us. Uh, the event will run for 60 minutes. We will have Q&A breaks, uh, three, so two within two sections, and then there'll also be a Q&A break at the end of the session please do use the Q&A box um, to ask your questions and you'll see that down on the bottom of your screen of a Zoom webinar platform. The replay and presentation will be available within 48 hours. So I'll be sharing out the deck and, um, and also the replay uh, to members through our library, but also for those non-members who are joining us today, I'll send you, a, send you a private link so you will have access to the information later. And you will receive, of course, a survey at the very end, it literally takes a minute to uh, complete. If you could, please let us know what, uh, what you've enjoyed about today, what you think could have been done better. And also, if you'd like to know more information about what we shared today, we're obviously uh, very happy to, to share that with you. So please do take the moment to fill that in. That'd be greatly appreciated. So I'd like to now hand over to our special guest. We have um, all the way from the UK, James Butcher, who's a CEO of Supply Pilot and welcome James, and also Mark Field, who's the founder and director of Prof Consulting Group. Um, and many of you will know Mark, and uh, Mark's a, and Prof Consulting are a valued PLMA member as well. So welcome, gentlemen. It's uh, great to see you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. No I'll just stop my screen chair, James, and hand over, hand over to your good self. Bill, that's, that's fantastic. And, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to, to present with James this afternoon. Really delighted to have the opportunity to engage with the, the PLMA members and, and some of the people wider outside of that. So again, thank you very much. So really excited this afternoon to to talk to the um, the audience or, or the colleagues regarding sustainability and what it, what it means. Um, as Bill says, Prof Consulting is a Melbourne-based uh, award-winning food and grocery consultancy. And, and what we realised very early on as more clients were talking to us about ESG, it's that to really understand what supplier capability are, you need to have a smart way of doing that. I've been lucky enough to know James for a number of years, both during my time in the UK and Australia, and it seemed a great opportunity for us to form a partnership and enable us to bring his technology and his expertise to uh, to Australia and help clients win. Ultimately, our aim is to enable consumers to make informed choices, which means we need to help suppliers understand the great work that's being done across their supply chain so they can deliver messages with confidence. James, if we could go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So just uh, very quickly, just to run you through the agenda. So what does it mean to be more sustainable? I think we'd all recognise from, from the businesses represented on this call that sustainability is different to all of us. But I think the thing that's most important is understanding our target customer groups and understanding what's important to that customer group so we can define messages that are really important for them and make meaningful impacts, uh, make meaningful statements that have got impact in those areas that are important. So we're going to cover some of that. Then we're going to move through to sustainability doesn't have to cost the earth. And there's some slides I'm going to share with you from my recent trip up into the UK of some of the great work I've seen happening in, in the UK market and, and probably most impressively, the way in which it's being communicated to customers at that point of purchase in store, which I think is super exciting. And I think having been in, in our local stores again this week, I think there's some great opportunities for us to, to dial that up and get you credit for the work that you're doing. And I think most importantly for me, it's about taking our customers or consumers on the journey. I think understanding the great work we're doing and, and using that to form marketing messages moving forward. So consumers give you credit as brand owners or manufacturers of brands that really understand what they're doing. So here's some pictures from, from London very recently. Obviously, Tesco's, who I think are doing some, some incredible work from an ESG. What I really liked is this labels here, calling out this packaging's already been uh, worked on by us and our suppliers. This is a level of reduction that we've made, and it's right front and center. So it's you know, right alongside their brand name, helping consumers make choices there. And I think it will come that consumers make choices on price, on quality and sustainability commitments. I thought this was a great example that really delighted to share with you today. If we can move on to the next one, James. So these are, these are some from a, a little bit further afield. So the one on the left, yeah. Yeah, I think we'd all recognize that we've got you know, some great messages in the market regarding grain-fed beef and grass-fed beef. But this is actually where people have understood their supply chain 
gone to that next step forward, embraced the ESG agenda, and are now talking about regenerative, regenerative farming. Yeah, This is actually from the PLMA uh, show in Chicago 2022. I was lucky enough to go with Bill and Austrade on that fantastic trip, but that time in market really showing you how suppliers are trying to differentiate in a really competitive space such as beef. And then the one on the on the right there, this is from uh, Sainsbury's. They launched this two weeks ago in the UK. I actually shared this picture through LinkedIn and had over 40,000 impressions because of the impact it made. Reducing plastic by 50% across something that's such a key commodity and the way in which they've got behind that to really show consumers, again, you can see it front and center being called out. So really important messages in, in overseas markets that I think we will start to see more of here. So that was just a very brief introduction. I'm delighted to introduce James, who's a long-term friend and, and CEO of Supply Pilot. And I really hope you enjoy the session this afternoon. And please make use of the question box, as, as Bill has said, and, uh, and look forward to the next 40 minutes or so. James, over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, so very quickly, context on Supply Pilot. Um, we used to be called Solutions for Retail Brands. Um, we renamed a little over a year ago. Um, we're doing more and more actually with manufacturers, not just the retailers, um, and that felt, felt appropriate. Um, and we're also doing more in the ESG space. Um, I myself, say, as Bill kind of said, a CEO at Supply Pilot. I'm also an alumnus of University of Cambridge's Sustainability Leadership. Um, as Supply Pilot, we work with companies to engage their suppliers, those three big bullets there, engaging your suppliers around what you're trying to do collecting data from your suppliers to enable that change and supporting suppliers through that change. And that can be anywhere in the supply chain. So that can be a retailer working with the manufacturers of retail, be manufacturers on this call working with the next level in that supply chain. And it's completely issue agnostic, anything from responsibly sourced palm oil to packaging reduction. Um, and the, our solutions in their approach were deliberately designed to be issue agnostic. And that's really relevant in today because it's about what your brand is trying to do, what your product is trying to do, what are you trying to stand for and where does your value? So there's just a cross section of some of the different issues that we've worked on. Um, it's by far not all of them, but it gives an idea of the breadth that this approach takes. Um, and a selection of our clients across the bottom around the globe, uh, many of which you'll hopefully recognize. Um, why this is really important is for whoever we are, particularly in the food space, 80% plus of our supply chain emissions, or scope three as they're called, are in the supply chain. And 95% of our net, if the natural capital is in the supply chain. So ultimately, if we want to have sustainable and resilient supply chains, we have to work with those people in our supply chain to be more sustainable. And whilst I think carbon has stolen the agenda for many, um, we run the risk of being um, overly blinkered towards um, almost myopic about carbon. Most of these other issues all roll up to carbon. If we reduce food waste, it reduces carbon. If we reduce packaging, it reduces carbon. If it's non-food, if we're making going towards greener chemistry, typically that greener chemistry reduces carbon. So hopefully, wherever you are in the supply chain today, this is relevant. And I've got examples. Um, say for both brands and manufacturers. A risk of preaching to choir and doubling down on what uh, Mark said there in the introduction. Yeah, this is this is um, research, research, only 2022. So despite all the pressures of supply chain, COVID, inflation, et cetera, half Australians still actively look for greener products or services. Um, and Almost half of those people under 30 will actually stop using a brand if it's not seen to be sustainable. So there's the two sides to it. It's be, being seen to make a difference or actually the danger of being seen to do nothing. Um, so, again, whether we're the brand owner looking at what are we going to put on the shelf or a manufacturer taking solutions to those brands to actually say, how can we make a difference? There's also a lot of scepticism, however. Um, a lot of concerns about greenwashing. Um, just simply saying something is responsibly sourced isn't good enough. Again, recent research, 2022 from Deloitte, um, simply saying, oh, yes, responsibly sourced. Consumers um, are not engaging with the, oh, I'm going to save how many million tons over this many years because they can't relate to it. Um, 
And specifically from that same research, the number one thing consumers value is not a will be net zero by 2040. Again, that's all part of the messaging that needs to happen. It's um, really important. But for non-discretionary purchases, which is those everyday purchases that most of us on this call will be selling, the number one issue ahead of ethical working, ahead of carbon footprint, ahead of human rights is I want to be able to see that a product is sustainable and the packaging sustainable because it relates to them at the point of purchase, which is why I love the examples that Mark chose to share to tee this call up. It's actually, what am I doing when I'm in that store, when I'm online, when I'm making that click purchase? But <clears throat> it's a long road. Um, we all know we're in an uncertain economic climate. We continue to suffer supply chain disruption. So how do we overcome some of those issues? Um, and probably a picture to surprise you in this one. I'm just going to put this up. I'm sure we all recognize this picture. Um, someone once did this at another, I'm, I'm stealing somebody else's thunder because they basically they put up a picture and went, everything that's not green in that picture came out of a hole in the ground, right? And there's not a hole in the ground for us to put it all back in. Um, so yeah, we you know, love the Botanic Gardens there. Um, just about hidden out of view. But ultimately, it really brings home the finite resources that we're living in. And we're outside already at five out of nine planetary boundaries. If people don't know what planetary boundaries are, it's basically going, what is the what is the globe producing every year and how much are we consuming every year? And it's an Olympic size challenge. Earth overshoot day in 1970 was late December, and that was basically by the end of December, we've pretty much used one planet's worth of resources. In 2022, Earth Overshoot Day was July 28th. Right? We're basically using two planets worth of resources a year. And that comes through in things like a third of all food being uh, food produced being wasted. Um, that contributes to biodiversity loss. So <clears throat> um, ultimately, that little graphic on the right hand side, we've all got to strike that fine, fine balance between the environmental impact, the social impact, and ultimately still being economically viable and how do we make all of our businesses successful? So one of the questions we often get is, you know, ultimately, how do we keep this sustainability on track in the face of an uncertain economy? And I'd answer, it's because we have to keep it on track. We've seen this around the globe. Last year, I learned a new term, heatflation. Um, clearly, yeah. Australia, as much as anywhere, seems extreme weather. This was just some of the impacts around the globe, um, reduction in um, crop yields, reduction in fruit yields, reduction in milk yields from cows in, in barren landscapes. So ultimately, when people are going, well, we're prioritizing supply chain issues over sustainability, I go, they're the same thing. Yeah. At the end of the day, if I can look at a more resilient supply chain, um, which obviously a closer supply chain, but if I can have a more resilient and regenerative supply chain, it will be more sustainable because it's more resilient and regenerative and it will be more viable as a business. Another graphic just to bring over the importance of why the retail um, community will be looking to those first tier suppliers. And I, I'd encourage all of those first tier suppliers looking at next people in their supply chain is this point about over 80% of the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, of the impact being in the supply chain. So research from McKinsey is by working with your supply chain, you will have a 10 to 24 fold impact compared to work looking at your own impact. Um, obviously it depends where you are in the supply chain, depends what materials you're providing, but ultimately it's, it just really highlights the value of engaging with suppliers. So, um, our recommended jump off point is, um, I say, is to avoid that carbon myopic uh, view and basically look at a number of different areas. So we would encourage anybody who's early on the journey to start with a version of we've got a thing called a kickstart assessment. Um, but there's other ways to do this. But basically reaching out to suppliers and understanding where they are on the journey. So. If you've got, if you're in the lucky position where all of your suppliers have got approved science-based targets, which is highly unlikely, um, but if that's the case, then there's one way of engaging with those suppliers that takes you forward. If all of your suppliers can't spell ESG, 
then ultimately it's a very different approach to how to engage. And that's true on all of these different pillars. Um, it's also really important getting ahead of legislation that's coming around the globe on deforestation, um, tightening of legislation about human rights, and ultimately the reporting legislation that will come into play around carbon. So all of this informs and even GSK took their top 300 suppliers then to breaking into cohorts of those who really knew what they were doing. And ultimately those who said carbon, well, yeah, climate what? Um, and just didn't have that understanding. So doing some form of kickstart to understand where your suppliers are to build a strategy that allows you to play to their strengths and embrace the power of working as a team. So first, first thing for me is around the board table, when you're sitting talking to your um, retail clients, when you're sitting talking to your suppliers, you've got to keep sustainability high because it is key to your resilience and keeping your business on track. It's not optional. So as Bill had suggested, got a few little breaks in there. So just wondering if we've got any questions already that have come through in the uh, channel, Bill. Um, not not as yet. Um, we haven't got any come through uh, quite yet, James, but I think um, obviously there's a lot of information being covered here. So please, uh, if, if members do, uh, do have some questions, send them through to James. I think some of those some of those facts um, are incredible what you just shared there. And I think also, you know, and, and I agree with what Mark shared up front. I mean, some some great examples that you're seeing offshore in terms of how, um, you know, how uh, retailers are actually putting sustainability front and centre in front of a consumer. I just like I know, I, when you were saying early on about um, you know being issue agnostic as well, James. Like clearly, there's so many there's so many focus areas. What about when you so steal your thunder as we get into it? So many focus areas um, where you know that that are impact points for consumers. Are, are there any of those in particular that uh, that you're finding it is where most of the interest is coming from from a manufacturer perspective? Um, <clears throat> packaging is one that's impacting everyone around the globe, and and I think it's legislation's putting costs into place for packaging to that point from that uh, Deloitte research. Consumers recognise and understand it. It's an easy one to get at. It's also yes. one to, it's an easy one to be criticised for, but it's also one, and I've got some examples shortly, but if you get the packaging right, again, despite the myth that sustainability costs, it normally doesn't. Um, but that's the other reason for doing the, the kickstart is ultimately, if you go to your suppliers, um, yeah, we, we, for example, have found companies who've unearthed opportunities. Um, so this is now the retailer looking down and the unearthed opportunities around things like fair trade. But they basically have fair trade products or products that could be certified fair trade. But they didn't know because they'd never asked. Mm, right. Yeah. Um, actually, um, yeah. So oh, actually, all of my all of my items are already responsibly um, sourced palm and soy. And therefore, let's tell consumers about that or tweak out a little bit. It's not mm. by the same token, that initial reach out. If all of your suppliers are going, no, I'm not a responsible source, then let's also make sure we don't put unrealistic goals into place that bring unnecessary burden. So it's about, that's why Kickstarter's about informing where to go for you. And it will be different for everybody on this call based on where, what categories are and where the supply chain sits. Mm. But I think that where to focus piece is probably a good segue, given there's no um, questions into my next um, segment, which is, um, I, I <clears throat> If I was in a room, I'd ask people to put their hands up, but um, I, I like to talk about people. This is someone who most of us in the food industry won't recognise. This is um, Ticciono. Um, he's widely credited as the inventor of the Toyota manufacturing system or lean manufacturing, something that we will all have taken some elements of in our business today because it basically just reset manufacturing doctrine for the last couple of last few decades. But ultimately, what does lean mean? Lean means without waste and in the context of today that's using they mentioned things like earth overshoot day and planetary boundaries it's using the earth's limited resources in a sustainable manner so when i qualified as an engineer many years ago um we didn't really study sustainability we studied something called resource efficiency i think we need to rediscover what i would say those good old days of resource efficiency ultimately i've got finite resources so how do i avoid wasting money, wasting time, wasting materials, wasting packaging. We probably all think we're doing that today, but when you when we visit in a lens, it's amazing the number of examples that are there. And being resource efficient is by its very nature sustainable. And in a context of where we've got the issues is being resource efficiency is about doing more with less. So it's also economically sensible, um, no less, no less so given the 
climate we face today. So um, this was originally uh, slided for the UK news. Um, it's actually, I'm pleased to say, it's um, now the Little Big Dairy Company is um, doing something similar there um, in Australia. But basically, Waitrose scrapped the coloured caps on the top of milk jugs. Right? It's something that we've had around the globe. We put coloured caps on. It's an absolute convenience issue. If I've got a nice big green label telling me this is semi skim, do I really need a green cap as well? But actually, those coloured caps were less sustainable to make and harder to recover and recycle. So by actually replacing those coloured caps with clear caps allowed a higher recycle content, which reduces um, costs around things like extended producer liability and um, costs around um, using virgin materials. Ultimately, it will cost less in time as recycled materials will become significantly cheaper as these taxes start to bite. It was something that ultimately, it's, it, clearly it took some development just to make sure there was no impact on the integrity. But for me, it's a very simple example of just thinking differently, looking at what could be changed. It's now something that's been adopted by many retailers and hopefully will be adopted by many, many more because coloured plastics are one of the more difficult things to manage where if we can go with um, the clear HDPE, it's so much easier to recover and use over and over and over again. Um, removal of best before dates. Again, it's something we're seeing more and more around the globe, but it's about thinking differently. I, I'm of an age, don't know how many more could do this on the call. It's best before dates were introduced to drive consumption. Right? Funnily enough, if you take them off, it will reduce that overconsumption, which contributes to so much food waste as we, as we've seen. Right? So when Waitrose did it, they looked at some over 500 lines. Sainsbury's initially 270 something lines. Sainsbury's the one who quantified it. Um, you know, 17 million items saved in terms of waste. That's the packaging waste, it's the food waste, it's all the water and everything that's gone into growing that waste. So ultimately, um, it's good for the environment, it's good for business. So what's interesting is, that's something we've applied, people have looked at with fresh produce. Why are we still putting a best before date on the vinegar, which is basically a preservative? Right? Why do we why do we put a best before date on salt? Right? It's um <clears throat> there is it, it is ultimately um there is a quality thing that you know things like oils and vinegar will ultimately um reduce over time. Um, you know, but all but in a spirit of being more sustainable. Um, there's no nothing, no legislation that says I have to put a best before date on it, so it's a quality guide. So fundamentally, people need to think differently. Um, packaging. Um, one of the most horrible packs on the market in terms of how we recycle is the laminated pillow pack that you get with your bags of Lay's, for example, which is Walker's is the UK Lay's, PepsiCo. Um, and people are still working out what to do with that one, but they have taken the multi-pack and put it into, put into cardboard. 250 tonnes of virgin plastic saved by putting a cardboard box, something that can relate to consumers. And another simple example I like, this is just comparing a European cereal packet to a US cereal packet. The US cereal packet is 4% larger, it's just two inches of wasted space at the top of the pack. Um, it was done for merchandising reasons and making it look bigger on the shelf. Um, but ultimately that's, 37% more space that's being shipped around on the back of a truck and 22% wasted packaging. So what's the equivalent in your business where ultimately we've not looked at the pack for the last 30 years and we could change it and save? It doesn't have to be, when people talk about innovation, it doesn't mean I've got to go and find some new, you know, packaging made out of seaweed or something like that. In some cases, just looking differently and going, how can I change the shape of the pack? How can I change the size of the flap? Whatever it might be that all reduces. Um, and why is that all really important? It comes back to this point here of how how can I do this in a way that will consumers will relate? So say so if you're a, if you're a retailer sat here talking with you know, this, engage your private label suppliers with this narrative, and that's where someone like ourselves can help. And if you're a manufacturer, look to your suppliers, look to your packaging suppliers, but take this to the retailer. They're looking for things that they can actually put on the shelf and re resonate in the same way we saw with Tesco's. And if we want to really see an opportunity for doing some differently, I mean, I just love to say <clears throat> in Waitrose, we did 
a little less, they did a little less perfect veg. The, the, the stuff that used to not make the grade in terms of that perfect vegetable on the shelf. Morrison's did their wonky veg. Misfits Markets in America seized on I mean, it made a whole business out of it. It's now on track to do a billion dollars sales by 2024, right? That was, that came from somebody looking at Apple Drop and going, can I buy that? And not many years later, he's looking at a billion dollar business. And that all comes from resource efficiency that says, what's that waste? So um, my number two takeaway is really reframing sustainability. And no, it's not a tree hugging exercise. How can we do this to be me more resource efficient, which will mean we will be more sustainable businesses in terms of the planet, but we'll be more sustainable in terms of the longevity of our own robustness of our own business by using materials correctly, wherever we are in the supply chain. On that theme, I'm not gonna to get too far into this. Um, as Bill said, this, this, this will be shared. If you want to share and um, scan that QR code, there's a separate presentation I've done specifically on marginal gain theory and really doubling down on this, um, you know, the fact we face an Olympic challenge. Um, marginal gain theory was something made famous by um, so David Brailsford, who was the GB Alunku coach, who basically dissected everything about cycling and put it together 1% at a time, which is why ultimately back in 2012, um, GB basically won a record number of medals and set up uh, five or six years of unrivaled success, having inherited a team who basically hadn't won anything worth talking about since about 1908. Um, and it is the fact that it's don't just work with your top few suppliers. You need to do that to some extent. You apply Pareto into where you will apply some of your effort, but engage all of your suppliers, bring them all on that journey. If everybody can be that little bit better, <clears throat> it all rolls up some big impact. So understand supply readiness with something like Kickstarters I've alluded to. Align them against what you're trying to do with your private brand, which I think to Bill's question is, you decide where you can win. You can decide what will resonate for your consumers by category. And then make that a data driven base where you engage with suppliers, applying the marginal gain theory to scale that. There is no silver bullet and there is no one size fits all. But if we can get lots of suppliers making those small benefits, we'll make an impact. So pausing for breath again and seeing whether we've got any questions come through. Thanks, James. Lots of uh, lots of really good information there. And um, I, I, there is a question that's actually come through. I might just uh, jump straight to that before I just pick up on a couple of points I wanted to raise. But um, someone has asked a good question. Is there uh, much use of organic materials such as coconut husks converted into packaging in international retailers? And if so, how is it performing and how is it being perceived by consumers? So it is starting to be used and certainly at the packaging so i was at the um the national packaging show about a month ago where there was a lot more of that sort of material coming through i think that for mainstream it's not being properly communicated um and i think that's one of the real issues here and again teed me up perfectly for the third segment which is a bit about the consumer communication today um the yeah, I think one of the big challenges is that um, what does it really mean? How does it relate to and therefore how can I use that? There's also some practical issues in the UK, which don't exist all over the globe, but um, the some of the organic and compostable packaging options. Um, there's no real domestic curbside collection route for. So there's been a lot of confusion with organic things when people are talking about compostable, for example, which is they're not really domestic compostable. A lot of them need to be um, industrially composted. But if they but if they go in the recycling bin, they actually contaminate the other recycling streams. So I think the um, the people who are really trying to push that forward need to, in one part, really get the communication right and face into what they mean. So if it is compostable, can you really? put this in the compost at home, or does it need to go somewhere industrially? How do I get it back? And also make sure they understand what that waste stream is. Because if it's going to contaminate municipal waste, 
then you're going to get pushback from those municipalities that said actually it's it's going to really struggle to hit the mainstream. Mm-hmm. Where you are seeing it a lot more is you're seeing it in things like um, fast food outlets, where actually rather you know you actually eat in and you eat something where you then can put it in, then they can industrially compost it. Mm-hmm. But it's not really, um, I think, hitting the mainstream on the uh, supermarket shelves. That's interesting. Thank you. And I think, you know, um, you were saying earlier in terms of, you know, consumer understanding a lack thereof and without wanting to spoil your thunder for the next piece. But I think, you know, and even some events we're running with retailers where, you know, obviously sustainability is high on the agenda. And, and th- th- there's a lot of talk about the fact that consumers just don't know. They just don't understand even, you know, what, what you put in your recycle bin, what actually is recyclable. You know, like th- there's, there's such a lack of clarity in many respects. And then as you just said, like, you know, you bring in local municipalities or councils or whatever versus states versus cities and <laughs> there's so many different variations so so it, I, th- I think being able to sort of drill down and really understand where you can add the value and then communicate that clearly be you a manufacturer or retailer or working in, in you know together in on that is is, is critical yeah. and i think it's critical but we're all clear we're all here you know we're all businesses um, so hopefully we've got aspirations to be more sustainable. But this was research. So the research from um, Nielsen in 2021, I don't have the Australian equivalent of this, I'm sorry, um, but was a $15 billion lost sales opportunity, basically, in terms of sustainable products, sustainable packaging, which is about how do you address that need in a way that you do clearly communicate, you don't run risk the risk of greenwashing and you have thought through your whole supply chain so for example can that waste be collected etc right so yeah this is yes we've all got to be more sustainable yes we've got to protect our businesses because they will rely on sustainable supply chains but there's opportunity this for me was um some of the most shocking research i saw which is actually uk retailers are held up often as um some of the the best at private label because ultimately a lot of it started here in the UK many years ago with Tesco and Sainsbury's and we've got some of the highest market shares for private label here in the UK and because of some of the UK legislation have been some of the more progressive in terms of sustainability measures this research from BXG basically identified that they thought they'd lost eight billion dollars of lost sales by basically failing to communicate so actually doing things, taking stuff forward, and I'm led to believe, and this is only rumours, but actually some of this research is what led to things like the Tesco example that Mark shared earlier, of putting it on the front of the pack and going, here's what we're doing, come and actually resonate with it. Right? So there's lots of things we're doing we're not telling consumers about. So there's a, there's a company um, I have the fortune to meet. They basically changed the way they wash potatoes. Right? Um, it's a very simple business. It's largely to do with potatoes. They've changed the way they're washing potatoes, which is largely recycling the same water with some clever widget from Loughborough University. And they've reduced the water use by 90%. Right? And the when you actually quantify that, I forget their numbers because it was, a, it was a, a private presentation, but it was um, it's huge. They're not told anybody about it. They didn't even tell their retail customers about it. Yeah. Which I say, if you're if you're if you're a manufacturer on this call and you're doing those things, make sure you're telling the retailer. If you're a retailer, why are you not telling the consumer? Why are you not saying, by look, this 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 is how much it saves and put it on the pack? I love this simple example. It's one of the I it was um so as the so lots of people you've got the plastic tray the plastic punnet um which has been pet for forever for most people which is recyclable and the lid was non-recyclable for many people for a long time and when they changed and made it a recyclable so the whole thing could be recycled they put that big bold flash across the top said 100 percent recyclable i wish i'd got a copy of the original pack from 2020 because in 2020 it was nearly a third of the pack was given over to saying now 100 percent recyclable right it was right in your face at point of purchase that says buy this one it gave me a reason to buy it 
I put in my fridge and it told my whole family as a reason to be buying this. Oh, isn't that great? Where, uh, you know, don't know how many people know Asda, but Asda at the budget end of UK retail, they weren't seen to be leading this. And actually this was um, when um, this was one of a number of initiatives that actually really put Asda forward as look what we're doing. It also recognised that whole point about the waste stream, because working with OPRL, who is the, the UK standard for recycled labelling, is one of the big issues is that if you don't put on the front of the pack, people will still tear the, tear the lid off and put it in the trash because they just assume it's because they're not going to read the label on the back to see whether it's recyclable because they've been buying the same product. It looks the same as they've bought for the last decade. So they will follow behaviour. So if you really want to make an impact and actually get this PET to get recycled back, you've got to actually tell them anyway to make sure they're putting the right, right bin back at their home. So for me, that was a, just a really great example of doing that engagement well uh, on the shelf, getting the credit for what you're doing. Not exactly, of course, you'll sure call this news because this was actually news in 1996. Right? But it was that coming back to this point about best before dates, um, people used to put beer on best, best before dates on beer. I'm not sure how many people, when they're actually on their sixth beer at the bar, be bothered to read the best before date. Um, and I certainly know people, many people will drink it anyway. So, and they turned that around and made it a born on date. And I'm sure we all remember the adverts that were done at the time. And that it basically brought that whole freshness. So a bit like the taking the best before date off um, fresh produce, you know, again, where are you putting the best before date the day that you can change, you can use, that you can leverage, actually think differently? How can you communicate it to the consumer? It's a bit of an ironic example, two reasons. One, I argue it's not, not news anymore. And the other one is for reasons I don't know. And I just started putting best before dates back on beer. But, but I still love it as an example for, for fresh thinking. I also love this example in terms of um, communication. So I showed the cornflake box earlier that was just two inches too big. And one of the concerns people have is, well, if you make the box a bit smaller, are people just going to think it's smaller? They're going to buy something else. And you know, use your packaging to communicate. And I write, so, so Kellogg's have done this work to take the plastic bag outside of the um, I don't know whether this, is, this has hit the markets yet there, but basically by taking the um, plastic um, thing, I've got paper liner inside, freshness was the same, the production process was exactly the same, the entire Ricard and the inner can now be recyclable, um, albeit they're calling for the fact that plastic should be more widely recycled, because the issue is that it was, a, it was a theoretically recyclable pack, just one that the municipalities wouldn't use. But for me, I call it out as a bit of the fresh thinking, but I love the oh, that picture on the right hand side about just the way they've used the pack to communicate what they're doing. So if you do want to make something smaller, just change your artwork for three months in the meantime that says, hey, this pack's going to get smaller. Same great product, et cetera, but we're going to save this much. Right? That is that is your point of sale merchandising. And if you want to be really bold at um, point of sale, if you know that Decathlon brand, I know there's not many stores there yet, but there are a few. But when Decathlon started actually saying, we're going to recycle stuff and you bring it back to store, they literally changed the name on the front of the store. Right? This, is not a, this is not a Photoshop. This is literally, they changed it on the front of the store. So do these things, engage your suppliers, but tell your customer what you're doing and get the credit for it. The Waitrose example, they completely got it wrong because they did that great project to actually change the cap and they didn't tell any consumers why. It was in the industry press. We we're all patting ourselves on the back. Saying, hey, I've saved this much plastic, etc. No one thought to tell the shopper. Right. There was all sorts of backlash and fuming, etc. I mean, if you look at the picture on the shelf there, I think it's blindingly obvious that the label's very clear what colour it is, blue, green, red, et cetera. I don't need a colour cap. So why, why consumers were confused, you know, you must be, they must be there with their head in their hands. 
but I think it's it's a really, really good example of this. You've got to tell them what you're doing for the other side. So get the credit, but certainly don't get that backlash. Yeah. So put it in there and say what we've done. Tell them why it's good for them so they can be part of the forefront of that. Another example that's been quite recent in the um, in the UK press, don't know whether it made it over there. Again, very you know, went wild on the likes of LinkedIn. Was so Sainsbury's changed the traditional ground beef pack to a vac pack and resulted in customers with lovely expressions like it feels too compressed, it feels very medical and it's vile, right? Yes, it's going to save 450 tonnes of plastic a year, but it's only going to save that if consumers buy it in the new pack, right? So, but there was nothing. So I'll contrast that with the, exa the um, Tesco example that um, Mark shared at the top of the call. You just look at the pack on the right there. It looks awful on shelf compared to the old beef, right? And there's nothing on that label to tell me why or what they've done. Right? It's a huge opportunity lost, right? Um, actually, there's other byproduct benefits of it being backpacked, right? Theoretically, um, it actually tastes better because you effectively always, you're still always having the same effect of hanging it, so it's actually maturing still in the pack because what that's the impact that the backpack has. It certainly extends the product, extends the product life, so you're going to get less waste. It's going to be more economical for homers. So actually, it's good for you. You're going to throw in less of this expensive thing away. It takes up less room in the freezer. So many opportunities to say good things, but actually, it looks like somebody's bought somebody's kidney. Um, so you know, there's just the other sides, I think we, we don't talk enough about similarly what we go wrong. So my fourth lesson for today is basically make sure you're ensuring your customers engage with that narrative. And again, don't just think about the on-shelf. The manufacturers here, make sure your retailer engages with your narrative. What are you bringing to them? You know your business. You know the pros and cons. You should be bringing them the messages to them. Don't leave your share on the table. So. In terms of what we talked about today, um, so how do we take sustainability forward, not just mitigate risk, but actually get some of the credit for what we're doing and see some of those uptick in sales um, for being more sustainable. So number one, keep your sustainability on track because you're in the surge economy. Think about everything we've said today about how if I can look at more sustainable, less waste, um, more more robust supply chains i'm going to be more certain in my own business economy i do that by reframing sustainability from this green optional thing to resource efficiency let's reduce materials reduce waste reduce costs be more efficient be more competitive wherever we are in the supply chain no one's going to complain about us reducing costs Scale your performance by engaging your suppliers. Apply that marginal gain theory. Do not just engage the top 10, engage them all. Bring them all on the journey. If you're a retailer, I'll tell you that most of your innovation will come from the little suppliers. If you're a big manufacturer, a lot of your innovation will come from your smaller suppliers. And if you're a smaller supplier on this, seize on that innovation, tell people about it. So engage your customers with your sustainability narratives. Don't leave it on the table. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I know it's end of the day there, so hopefully there'll be a few questions, and if not, you will get to uh, hit the road early. <laughs> Thank you very much, James. A lot of really good insights there. I think no, but the key thing that comes through for me is um, is the community. Oh, it's probably two things. When you're talking about resource efficiency, I think that's really interesting because you know I, I like the way that you know you're sort of simplifying it down to to its core essence, you know, for, for many years in business, you know, companies have always looked at resource efficiency and whether it's across, you know, the, uh, you know, I guess, you know, headcount as well as, you know, operational efficiency, et cetera. But, you know, to actually bring sustainability into that sort of frame of reference makes a lot of sense. So, of course, there's, you know, it, it's, as you said, right up front, it's it's win-win. How do you actually create wins for your business whilst, you know, also doing the right thing but delivering a value add? But I think the other piece for me, which obviously you articulated very very clearly is, is the communication and i mean that that figure is astounding what you're saying with the uk supermarkets 8.1 pig and you know lost just by the you know the, the sort of you know the gold standard retailers um 
failing to take advantage and tell the people who should know what uh, what they're what they're doing. It's it, it, it's mind blowing, really. When you think about it, and also when you said earlier in terms of half of half of consumers, you know, in a sort of younger age set now, will it actually not choose a brand because it's not seen as being sustainable because it's not being communicated. I mean, you tie those three pieces together, and it's it's very clear and succinct the message and, and the opportunity. And I, th- I think the bit that goes across all of those is that we we will talk a lot about innovation. Mm. Everybody, we are, how are we going to innovate? And the reason I go back to teach owner bit is, is innovation with this doing less, doing less with more, right? Mm. Yes, there will be clever things where we've got, for example, new organic packaging and we solve the, we solve the uh, reverse supply chain for recovering that. That would be great. Right? But ultimately, you know, how can I, make use of that wonky veg how can i maybe relax the specification on something um some people have just looked at what is what are some of the expensive and hard to source ingredients and just taken them out of a formulated product Mm. and gone actually people could hardly tell the difference it was one of those things we put in when we were in the in better times um and it all was all great but actually i've i've taken that you know pinch of such and such out of a product and I've taken out cost one more variable etc um I think we've seen people by engaging with their suppliers have looked at um going back to shorter supply chains um you know COVID taught us one thing which is you know you got real issues when you've got long supply chains so if we're looking for resilience um then I want us to be sourcing locally when I can and if I can source more locally then it's probably going to be more sustainable it's not always the case, but nine times out of 10 will be more sustainable. Um, and I think making those simple changes, that's a, I, the, the, the cereal box for me was just the astounding one. I mean, it was literally, yeah. I, I got those I got those metrics by literally, I just bought one off the shelf and measured. So it was the same the same brand, the same product, just in two different countries where they're the, um, and I'm, fa- I'm pretty confident their concern would be I'm going to make the product smaller and what does somebody think on shelf? Because mm. I showed with that great Kellogg pack, I think you know, it's it's a great opportunity to, to relate to somebody on shelf, say, here's what I've done, here's what's different. Mm. So what can we do to change, um, yeah, pack formats, change the size maybe? Um, innovation can be quite simple. I mean, look, you know, the, the chicken example that... Um, Mark shared um, for the whole chicken. I'm, I'm sure there was quite a lot of trials to make sure there was no leakage, et cetera, et cetera. But it's um, there's there's a there's a lot can be done out there, and I think um, en- enabling that conversation. Um, obviously, I've got the supply pilot, particular drum to bang in terms of we help people do that at scale and scale that communication. But however it is engage that conversation get it all going and mm. i think the questions you asked i think it was probably the end of the first first break which is and where to focus engaging suppliers will help you understand where to focus where are their pains where are they going how can you help them and my my one big shout out to um retails on call is Make space for this in your RFPs. Make space for this in the discussion to allow somebody to turn up and say, I know you asked for this. What about this one? Right? It's going to hit the same spot on the shelf, but it's it's different. It's in my organic pack or whatever it might be. Um, and my and the big shout out to the manufacturers here is, is to really do that and turn up and tell them what the messaging is. Because if you think, if you arrive with a partly thought through oh, I can change this, I can change that, and you've not thought about how that's going to turn into a message, it's hard for that buyer who's also buying 400 other items to work that out themselves. So mm-hmm. turn up with a very clear, do this, this is why it's going to win on shelf, um, and we can all move in the right direction. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. And I think, you know, like private label is private brand and retailer brand. I mean, you know, always discussing that with members and talking about that. I mean, it's how retailers differentiate. And of course, they want to have the best offering on shelf. So it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, following a brand. I mean, it's a, it's a great, great opportunity to actually, you know, help support 
retailers, your retail partners to actually, you know, differentiate on shelf and actually stand out from the crowd and drive drive traffic, et cetera, which obviously ultimately benefits everybody. So, I mean, do, well, do I you think, think that's, that, I mean, oh, sorry, sorry, don't you go? Well, I was going to say, I, that is that is one place where private label is completely free. So mm -hmm. a, a brand has its one piece on the shelf and if it's trying to change consumer behavior, it's shouting and it's everything down that are. What a, what, a, what a retailer has is the opportunity to sort of do some choice editing and, obviously, and, and change something across a category, which again comes mm -hmm. back to this collaboration, shared ideas, et cetera. We saw it in COVID. And one of the, I mean, I, I love, um, not everyone talked about it openly, but Walgreens, um, the pharmacy chain in America, when we had the great toilet paper famine of 2020, um, <laughs> They openly said, we are only going to stock Walgreens toilet paper, toilet tissue, right? Um, they put all their effort into making sure they got their own brand on shelf. And they went from, I, I want to say, um, it was something like it was, it was high single digits or maybe only like 10% market share for their own brand. And actually afterwards, when all the other things were brought back in, they'd gone up to like 30% market share. Wow. Because ultimately, that's what was available, and people bought it and went, "It's all right, this, and it's mm. cheap, and mm. it's just, it's, I just get into habit for me." So um, I do think that involves retailers sometimes being bold and saying, I'm, "I am going to take, I am going to take away the comfortable choice." Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but you've got to get the communication right because I think the, the Sainsbury's Mints is a great example of. Um, everyone will get used to it. It's like everything; we will get used to it if it's the only thing available, but. If there was the new mints and the old mints continue for any length of time, people can just continue buying the thing they're familiar with. So there's also got to be some mm -hmm. choice editing. But I think that that Walgreens toilet paper is a great example. Uh, turn up, give it to them, make it what's available, trust in the brand, but get the messaging clear, which is why I love the fact that Walgreens came out and told people what they were doing. And they they and they saw there is the uh, fruits of their labours. Yeah, I think that's the key, isn't it? Telling people. That, that's really interesting. James, can I just ask you, just in terms of your experience, and obviously there's a, there's um, been some really good examples shared of, you know, what you've seen both from manufacturer and retailer point of view and some not so great ones, and it's a learning process. We all understand that. Are there any retailers around the world, um, or for that matter, any manufacturers or, or both, that you think are, are really doing it well and really, you know, like, like honing in on the points that you've raised there? Um, I think... In areas, I think it tends to come down to there'll be people in particular categories. Um, but I think one of the biggest issues is people understanding what they stand for. Mm. So, I mean, clearly, I shared the example of Misfit Markets. You know, they, we're, we're, they know exactly what they stand for. We're going to, you know, buy all the surplus pumpkin in, in every fall and we're going to make you, you know, delicious pumpkin soup you can have all year round, but it's going to cost you a third the price of going to your every other supermarket. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I think it's, it's, there's different areas. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I think a number of clients do the engagement piece very well in terms of asking this question. So packaging is a good example where all sorts of unintended consequences come if, if it's driven too hard down from the top that says you must do this. So, um, when we had the Blue Planet series a few years ago with David Attenborough telling us about plastic in the oceans, etc., there was a knee-jerk reaction to get rid of black plastic from ready meals, for example. Um, the black plastic trays, that, and we're still still awful in the UK for having too far too many TV dinners. Um, that plastic black black plastic tray was perfectly recyclable as a material. The issue was how is it recovered? So as an industry, if people have gone, we need to work out how to recover this. How are we going to identify it? How are we going to put a code on it that allows it to be sorted, et cetera? But we didn't. We actually, it was, no, we're going to move across. That got pushed down onto suppliers. So lots of suppliers had to go buy new machinery, new materials. Surprise, surprise. Manufacturers, all those private label manufacturers picked up the costs. Hmm. Most colored plastics used to get turned into black plastic trays. So actually it destroyed hmm. the waste stream for another plastic. Hmm. Right? What it also did is it pushed up all of the costs of the alternative because everyone was suddenly chasing for these alternatives. So I think what's really important, again, wherever you are in the food chain, when you set that ask, set the direction that says, what I want is I want this to be 
100% recyclable or reusable, for example, or I want it to be compostable, or I want it, whatever. Set the goal, but let the manufacturer come back with the how I'm going to solve that. And I think, again, that's manufacturers. If you hate that being pushed onto you, apply the same doctrine when you go out to your suppliers. Is how am I going to solve this problem, right? Um, so, um, yeah. Um, I've, I've, Very interesting. Sadly, I'm not sure I can name some examples. I was on the tip of my tongue to name. Um, yeah. But the companies we've done that with, they go out and they ask that and you push it down. And then also don't let perfection get in the way of better right mm. it's um the reality is if i don't know how to get rid of this particular packaging material but i can be clever and make that packaging material five or ten percent more efficient or twenty percent more efficient like my my um, cereal carbon example then do that now right mm. whilst we carry on trying to solve some of the problems so i think it's set the goal rather than mandate the how is what's being done really well and like i say don't let perfection get in the way of better the yeah the same with media example they say 450 tons of plastic i think the number was on that earlier slide it's still a non-recyclable material today mm. but it's a lot less of the material than they were doing a mm. month ago so i think that they're the kind of learnings but no i think the um I think I think that's the re my point of it. There's, there's a great opportunity for someone to stand up and say i am doing it differently and I am really known for this. And I don't think that anybody's doing that communication really well. Big opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, thank you, James. That's been really, really insightful. And I will share the insights out. Now, just um, I'm sure there'll be members on the call who'd like to know more and, you know, are thinking, well, okay, how can I apply this to my business and all my suppliers' businesses, be they small or large, um, in, in multiple different categories? What, what would be, you mentioned earlier, the, um, the Kickstart program. What, what's the best way? I'll share out details, of course, with members. But um what do you have any final words of advice for companies who might just like to you know start start that journey and understand you know really where, well, where they I sit mean, on that spectrum i'd i would encourage people to um follow the link that's in the qr code to information about our kickstart or message via you bill and i'm very happy to share more information because what kickstart does it explains what we're doing which is that going out to suppliers to understand that first thing and if it's not with us you know, if you've only got half a dozen suppliers, you don't need a tool, you need a telephone, right? Well, um, <laughs> but go go to those suppliers and across each of those things go, where are you today on your own carbon plan? Where are you with responsible sourcing? Things like responsible source palm, soy, mm. FSC for paper. Where are the materials of concern? Where are you for biodiversity? And use that to inform a strategy. So you're not trying to eat the elephant. Yeah, you're trying to take it one slice at a time and you also get some early wins. And if you get those early wins, it builds momentum because you'll see the impact on your business and everyone will want more. And everyone, and actually, maybe there will be the thing that requires a bit of capital investment. But it'll be easier because you'll be going to the board going, I did these three little things and look at the impact. Can I now have some money to go buy this new machine to do this, et cetera? So engage, engage your suppliers wherever you are in the supply chain. Go to that next tier down have the conversation about what they can do share examples like i've done here and then tell your customers about it fantastic james and you brought it right home right on the hour so well done <laughs> so, some really good insights there look thank you very much for your time today and thank you for sharing those insights and uh, allowing us to share this presentation with members too really appreciate it and also to mark thank you for uh the examples you shared which i think i think set up the um set up the event really nicely as well uh from that perspective and um i will as i said i will uh, not only through the survey but uh share out to members um the link as well so that they can uh, they can uh, look further into this and obviously come back via me and i'm happy to pass on details as as required so fantastic much appreciated sir and um oh fuck is it <laughs> yeah no thank you thank you very much bill no problem thank take care everyone have a great, great day. Bye -bye. Thank you very much cheers thank bye -bye. you thanks everyone bye yeah.